I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today we are going to be looking at uh, a text that you you actually pulled up. You you were the one who who wanted to do this. I had not read it, although I've read some some of the works by Ouyang Shou, the famous Song Dynasty writer and politician. Tell us a little bit about this text. This is called a shihua. It's a genre of writing that, well, like Ouyang Shou basically created. I mean, people were writing it before him, but he's the first one to write a full sort of book in this style. And a shihua is sort of just like a collection of jottings, notes, Scholars were, by the Tang Dynasty, getting together to sort of just chat about literature, share thoughts, sometimes share poems. The natural evolution was, well, if we're already sharing these jottings and these notes, why not just put some of these notes into a book? And so, Ouyang Xiu was the first one to sort of compress this experience and put it into book form. Now, it as a book, it's just a collection of ruminations. Some of them are just remembering times he had with friends talking about literature. Others are specific comments about a poem. It's semi-autobiographical in places. There's no real organization or structure. It's just collections of writings about poetry. Shihua, poetry, remarks about poetry. That's how Stephen Owen translates it. When it's done well, and the, the passage we're reading today I think is done very well, it is like... Really well done poetry commentary, kind of through the back door. Rob, would it would it make sense for uh, one of us to just read out Stephen Owen's translation? It's a short yeah. passage. Let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead and just do that. It's it's not very long. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, okay, uh, here I go. So this is Stephen Owen's translation. Uh, we're looking at readings in Chinese literary thought. So here I go. The scholar Su Shi is, is a native of Sichuan. Once he purchased a bow wrapping of a, an aboriginal textile sold by the southwestern barbarians. Into this cloth had been woven Mei Yao Chun's poem, Spring Snow. This poem is not considered an important piece in Mei Yao Chun's collected poems. It seems to me that May's fame was so great throughout the world that every single piece was passed on until it fell among the barbarians. And it is remarkable how those foreigners valued it. Knowing how close I was to Mei Yao Chun, Su Shi made a present of it to me when he got hold of it. My family has long had it in its possession a zither carved in 827 by Lei Hui 250 years ago. Its tone is as sharp and clear as if one were striking a piece of metal or stone. I used this piece of textile as the zither bag. These two objects are truly the family treasures. So there's lots of levels here, right? I mean, if if you never reflect any further, it's just a really nice reflection. It's It's by one eminent scholar reflecting on another... And another and a great poet. It's very personal. It's kind of wistful, melancholy in places. But there's a heck of a lot going on here. For example, so you have a poem by Mei Yao Chun, who was a great poet, a very renowned poet. But this particular poem only makes its way back into circulation, as it were, because of quote unquote barbarians, who themselves, it doesn't sound like we're actually reading it, they were using it as something to put on in into textile. So they didn't even know what it was, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think they knew what it was? You know, it's really hard to tell. Uh, the, the position of the aboriginal slash foreigners is is what makes this this short essay so cool for me. So first off, we should point out Mei Yao Chun is famous. Uh, we did his poem on uh, Mr. Five White, the cat poem. I don't know what's going on in terms of the position of the barbarians and how Ouyang Shou is thinking about them, because it seems like they, they have no idea. Like it, it almost seems like there's a hierarchy. Mei Yao Chun is just that great that he falls, and the materiality of his poem gets incorporated into a textile. So it's a text becoming a textile, which, you know, the English word text comes from textile. It, it had to do with the way the fabric was woven to make parchment and, and paper and things like that. 
but I, I just don't know what is going on with these barbarian slash foreigners. Rob, what did you think in terms of the fact that he's using the word barbarian in, in one sentence and then in another line he calls them foreigners? It's it's funny. You know, I'm tempted to say that they're aboriginals until they're connected with the poet Mei Yao Chen, and now all of a sudden they can be something different. Actually, it's not aboriginals. They use the word barbarians here. Yeah, I think the word is uh, E-D. Uh, so like E is is just kind of, I mean, it, it, it's barbarian, and D is a specific place or like a, it's a specific kind of barbarians. It was sometimes used to refer to Turks. So D and and the two are uh, of Turkey are kind of related. But I, I have no idea why he's using that word D here. But uh, E, it definitely makes sense to me. Yeah, it is interesting that it, there's it's two different things, but effectively three great writers, and one of them preserving the work of another in this very roundabout way, and it becomes a treasured part of his family, not because the poem is amazing. And notice here in this in this little little blurb, at no point does he say actually the poem is is incredible. It's the best thing he ever wrote. We don't actually learn anything about no. the poem itself. <laughs> we actually know. I take that back. We learn that it's not in one of his most famous ones. <laughs> right. It's just spring snow. That's all we know about it. And he even, Yo Yang Xiu says, this is not considered an important piece in Mei Yao Chen's collected poems. Now, the reason, I think that's interesting that Stephen, Stephen Owen translates that word as important because to me, it really, it works better that way because Yo Yang Xiu isn't saying it's one of the most beautiful or not most beautiful. It's important because Later on, it will be important to Ouyang Xiu, but not because of what it says, because it what it, what it actually is. This this as a piece of material, as as a material object, and he seems to shift gears. Right, he gets the the poem as a pre, the textile as a present, and then all of a sudden he goes, oh, and by the way, we had this this zither, this super awesome zither, and its sound is absolutely amazing and crystal clear. And so we decided to use the textile for the bag. What do you make of that comparison, right? Like it, it it's it's weird because they're two objects that have been handled by famous people or they incorporate bits of famous people into the materiality, but it, it's not sure, it, it's not clear what he's doing with that. So, you know, Chinese poetry in general likes to make these implicit comparisons where you just set two objects side by side and we're supposed to see a connection there. So you can see a reflection on his old friend Mei Yao Chun's poetry. And he, he's, instead of saying, I've always thought Mei Yao Chun's poetry would la- last the test of time and it's crystal clear and still beautiful years later. So instead, he talks about this zither. And as a way of bringing the two together, he uses this textile with a poem in it as the bag, right? It's the thing holding the zither. So the two together are supposed to have, I think, a similar resounding quality over the years but it's the materiality that's brought out right like he's using yeah. the 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 textile with Mei El Chun's poem as a bag it, it's not like the poem itself is really doing that much other other than like he has a a personal connection to it so i i still like so so does 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 poetry does does when the the sort of written language uh, that is is very much revered in in this Song Dynasty piece, but also I think throughout Chinese literature, is that is that does it, does it have some sort of material effect? Right, like is it just if you write something beautiful, can you take it as medicine and make you feel better? Like I, I, I'm just struggling with what Ouyang Shou is getting at. Now the materiality part is what is the reason I chose this. I've never read. I don't think any reflection on any poem in any epoch or culture like this, where the person the person effectively gets a poem as a cloth or a quilt or something. I mean, can you imagine T.S. Eliot going, the thing is, I found this Ezra Pound poem and somebody had knitted it into a sock and I thought that was great. Like, that would just be such a bizarre thing to reflect on. We should sell those on the podcast. We totally website. should. Yes, we should podcast socks i love it but it's it's also very this is a good example of this this whole genre sure when it's at its best it's not striving to be great this is just a reflection 
from uh, of one friend upon another friend's work, but in a very quirky and strange way. And I'm not either. I'm not entirely sure what to do with with the fact that it's it's a part of a of a textile of a of a thing. I think it's interesting though because. The Song Dynasty really is one of the high points also in the development of the civil service exams, the, the imperial civil service exams. And so under appreciating poetry has a really formal state-driven component to it in this era. This feels like the antidote to that. It's, it's like a great poet of his era saying, you know, yeah, you can study poems on the exam, but you know what else they can be used for? Holding a zither. <laughs> And we, we, you know, we laugh because why in the world would you do that? But it's a form of appreciation. He didn't throw it away. And both, it sounds like both Su Shi and Ouyang Xiao went, you know, that's really cool that this poem, of all poems, not even his greatest poem, ended up super far away. And somehow somebody thought it was worth preserving, even though they may not have understood it. And so they wove it into a cloth. It's a very hipster move, isn't it? it? Totally. Can you imagine? I wrote this poem, and then I you know, like bedazzled it or you know, ironed it onto my shirt or something. That could work. Uh, Rob, can I ask, do you think Ouyang Shou is being ironic here? How so? I mean, he's, he's saying, poetry's great. It can be used as bags to hold zithers. <laughs> I, I would love that. I would love it if that really was, he was just, having a good laugh, like, Mei Yao Chun's poetry is great. That's why we keep our guitar in it, you know? Now, of course, we're taking this out of context because this is in, in this is alongside a lot of other just reflections on a literary life, right? So this doesn't necessarily have to be just a reflection on a poem, but it seems to me if you had three longtime friends, scholars, and writers, They'd been communicating for years and years. Wouldn't you expect a certain level of humor involved there? If some of the writers who were working out of Paris in the early part of 20th century American writers like Faulkner and some of the others, can you imagine if one of them found another one's work woven into a shirt or something? I mean, I have to think they would absolutely have written something funny about it. So I think that's that's there's nothing wrong with appreciating it this way. Like, May Al Chen's a great poet, and I still think he's a great poet, but it still is funny that uh, a bunch of foreigners use his poem as a bag. It, it is much more of a, a kind of postmodern move, I would say. Yeah, we've been dancing around the materiality question. That's, oh man, the materiality of a text and all that for for so long. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. I think if we start, it'll, it'll just be ugly. When you say we, what you mean is like scholars and comp lit and, and, and adjacent fields, right? Yeah. People who are as interested in the actual object of the book as what's inside it. Like, let's write about the cover and let's write about the, you know. Um, I'd seriously doubt that's what Miao Chen is doing, but one of those scholars could have a field day with this one. Yeah, I, I actually think that is what what he's he's trying to go for please expand not too much though our listeners are not going to go with us very far down that road he is talking about the the materiality of the text i, I you know i'm not a a postmodernist rob i i think you know that um i think you're much more the postmodernist in our in our duo it does seem like ouyang Shou is thinking about the materiality of the poem i'm not sure what he's saying I don't claim to know that, but I, I think he is kind of doing this very postmodern move, uh, and it's funny. It's 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 hilarious. I mean, it's kind of not a, not hilarious in a like comedy club kind of way, but you're you're just kind of like, what is going on here? Yeah, and that's what I love about it. You know, for me, great literature, you should always walk away from it going, yeah, I don't know. I I I I really enjoyed that. I appreciate it, but there's a lot of stuff I don't think I can peg down. You shouldn't be able to peg literature down. And so that's why I picked this one out cuz it's it's like you say it's kind of funny. And the, but the more you think about it, the more little wrinkles you find. Like why does it matter that it was passed down by foreigners/barbarians? slash barbarians? Why do we have two names for them? Why does it matter that it held a zither? Or was it just, you know what could be interesting is if it's just, he just thinks it's nice and there's no subtext at all. He's like, it just happens to be the case of the zither. I don't know. Like we're, we're seeing a lot, but maybe for him, it was just kind of a fun reflection. 
I, I think that's a great place to end the podcast, Rob. You uh, pronouncing on great literature and, and wondering, you know, like trying to wander into Ouyang Zhou's psychological state. Uh, and, and probably missing it, but that's that's what great literature is. Hey, that's good. All right. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.